Landfills just a few years ago were forgotten about, covered up and capped, and that was it, they were done. Well now, the cap is being uncovered, and the plastics and the commodities that are in those dumps are being harvested, and on top of that, there are particular companies that are specializing in harvesting the biogas, which is created in a landfill, and turning a turbine and making electricity. This is going green for green. It's out of sight and out of mind What is the state of our humankind And I don't know what to say Cause we produce my heart every day And we call it garbage Landfills, landfills, landfills Horrible, horrible, horrible human behavior Not much we can do about it they're necessary evils. What are we gonna do? We're consumers. We just can't stop it. So but you gotta start looking at, at our waste as a resource. And at Walker, uh, they're doing a good job of it. This is incredible. Everything you see here is landfill. We're on a 500 plus acre landfill site. We've had a landfill at our Niagara Falls location since 1982. We do take um, a lot of ICI, industrial, commercial, institutional waste from the city of Toronto here, and we do get organics through that system. We get a lot of paper still, which is unfortunate, but it still shows up in garbage quite a bit. And all of that material will break down in the landfill and, and uh, create uh, landfill gas. I hate landfills. Who doesn't? But you know, you gotta give these people credit. 22 kilometers of piping and a network of fittings that actually go into this ground here, drawing from 80 plus wells, all that get sucked into this little facility just down over the hill over here. And it creates 4,500 cubic feet per minute of biogas. 3,250 CFM, cubic feet per minute of that gas, is tripped over to Abitibi Bow Water, where it's used in the recycling of the newsprint process. Now they have the flare, that little stack that you see just over here. Some days the earth gets heated up and you know it starts shaking and moving around. The water comes into the ground and they get excess gas. Boom, that flare goes off and it's a protection. It's kind of like a release valve if, if too much gas is created, okay? 4,500 cubic feet per minute of biogas. I could talk to you about gillijoules and all kinds of weird terminology, but I'm gonna simplify it for you. Basically, you're looking at enough, enough gas to power 15,000 homes. In order to try and understand landfill biogas, what its potential uses are, how it's created, I tracked down Camilla Swagger from Agate Laboratories. And as Camilla knows, I'm not a big fan of landfills, but she's going to tell us more about what's going on. Easy there, Michael. Landfills have definitely come a long way. Let's take a look at this. The production of biogas from landfills is dependent on something called anaerobic digestion. This means that microorganisms are used in an oxygen-free environment to digest large organic molecules and eventually produce methane gas and carbon dioxide. Methane is the main constituent of natural gas. So in a lot of ways, biogas is very similar to natural gas. Walker and Abitibi Bowwater have made a unique partnership to try and reduce their carbon footprint. They have basically harvested biogas from the landfill, piped it across the street where the gas is used in the process of recycling newspaper from your blue bin. We initially talked to Abitibi and there wasn't much interest or were concerned about the whole issue of burning landfill gas. And I think over a period of years we persuaded them that this had been done on many occasions in other jurisdictions, especially in the US, and that it was quite safe to burn landfill gas in their boilers. And we signed a contract with them in 2002 and built the pipeline and started piping their gas into their boilers. Where we do about 3.6 million cubic meters a month to the Abitibi plant, and that displaces 40 to 50 percent of their total energy needs. And that's significant because they're the single largest methane gas user, natural gas, in the region of Niagara right now. So it's a significant displacement of fossil fuel there. And uh, we've done a lot of papers with Abitibi at different conferences, and there's been a lot of interest in the whole concept here. We have the, a 20-year contract with the region of Niagara for source-separated organics from the region. 
And we also have a contract here at the City of Toronto for their leaf and yard waste collection. We've had that for the last five years. One of the things I think municipalities make a mistake on is they continue to collect grass. Grass is very high in nitrogen, so you need a lot of wood or wood fi fibre in there to offset that nitrogen. Um, that's the recipe situation. I think where municipalities ban grass from organics collection, you get a much better recipe and you reduce the potential for odours. Abitibi Bowater, a Welland staple uh, in the newsprint pulp and paper industry here for the past century. Um, this plant we're about to tour is uh, manufacturing 100% recycled newsprint. Uh, the facility uh, was, just 20 years ago, still pulping and making a mix of recycled newsprint along with, uh, with real pulp from trees and from chipping logs in the yard here. Uh, that has all changed. This is 100% newsprint recycled material. Uh, Abitibi Bowwater, currently in Chapter 11, has been quite aggressively trying to change their business practices, update equipment, become more energy efficient, become more cost effective, etc. Thus, one of the relationships with Walker Industries, saving the cost of actually producing the steam to, uh, to in, in, within their process to recycle the newsprint, um, that biogas coming from Walker Industries has saved money, saved them time, uh, and has made the process that much simpler. So it's interesting in that you know, Abitibi, one of, the, one of the struggles has been developing the recycled industry and newsprint out of recycled materials at one price, and then as Chinese demand has escalated beyond probably anybody's wildest dreams, that price has continued to rise. So it's created challenges here. But I think you'll find that uh, Abitibi is, uh, is really doing quite, a, quite an amazing job, and I think you'll see them as a successful company in the long run. This is Going Green for Green. We're going to be right back taking a tour of the Abitibi Bowwater Welland 100% recycled newsprint facility. Check us out online at www.goinggreenforgreen.tv or follow us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Going Green for Green is brought to you by Ontario Electronic Stewardship and RecycleYourElectronics.ca So this is where the uh, uh, biogas from uh, Walker, this is where it actually comes into Abitibi uh, and where the steam is created. And um, this is the beginning of the process. Basically, uh, the operation is uh, once the paper gets into the conveyor system and it goes into a, a massive drum pulpers, we will see the drum pulpers as we go forward. And the purpose of the drum pulper is to make sure we take all this paper and pulp it back up. And also, we are adding chemicals to this mix of pulp so that I can take the ink out. Because as you can imagine, in the press rooms, when they write on this paper, they have lots of ink on this paper. Our job here is to take the ink out. The drum pulper is the first process to pulp it, make sure that the ink is start coming off the paper. Abitibi paper. I mean, look at, look at, this is humanity. This is our consumption. This is what we do. Look at all this paper. Um, so kind of cool that Abitibi is using biogas to aid in the energy usage here. Um, this paper is, is, as Saeed has told us, you know, is broken down and, and basically reused. Um, and out of the blue bins, they, they, they take 80% and it is reused. 20% is the plastic bottles and the, the regular contaminants that you might find in anybody's blue bin on the curb. Um, but again, you know, look at this mountain. It's really quite something. As you can see, uh, this material that comes up here is all the material that we cannot make any paper from. So what happens with this material is that it gets rejected by our operation. That material goes in the truck, and the truck goes into the, uh, actually up in the New York State. Over there, they burn this stuff and actually make energy from this. And all the metals that comes up here also gets distracted from that stuff and then be sold back into operation. So this is what we call all non-fiber material that gets also recycled here. In here, not only we receive paper, but newspaper from people that uh, read the paper and leave it outside their homes and we collect them. We also get stuff that are, we call magazine grade. The stuff that in the offices, 
or in the press rooms, they have extra when they make the magazines or when they have extra in the offices, when they share the document, we always get that stuff too. And we also can recycle any materials from the office uh, or from press rooms or from any kind of magazines in our operation. Basically, this is the heart of our operation, whereas uh, all the control systems that runs the plant that we just basically walked through, it's been controlled from here. Everything is automated. The quality control is automated. Plus the visual cameras, as you can see, every heart of our operations are going to be also visually monitored as to make sure that there's any problems. We have three operators, up to four operators here at a time in the control room, and they basically they monitor the whole 1,400 tons operations of the pop mill right from these consoles, and they can change uh, the valves and all automated, and all operations basically uh, based on the DCS controls uh, of this room here. In the Abbott Tibby uh, uh, paper machine room here, you've seen some of the large equipment and the, the rollers and, and all the activity. Uh, basically what happens here is they take the slurry from your blue bin waste that they've put in that great big washing machine and chopped up, they've extracted and washed out and taken all the contaminants out. And when they have their recycled pulp from the newsprint and the paper, it then comes in here and it is uh, formed. And it is formed by going along a conveyor with uh, material which uh, is pressed and the water is extracted and sucked out of uh, uh, that material. And then it is put through the drying process where it is dried and eventually uh, newsprint is made right here from your blue bin box. Check us out online at www.goinggreenforgreen.tv or follow us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Going Green for Green is brought to you by the Royal Bank of Canada. Mike Watt talks to us about anaerobic digestion, green energy, and how the Green Energy Act is gonna stimulate investment in this sector, and what the potential uses are. And for a municipality like Toronto, where anaerobic digestion can be used. There's a role for aerobic systems, and there's a role for anaerobic systems. In a city like Toronto, with the urban densification you have here, there's not a lot of space for um, producers to site and run aerobic facilities. It's very congested, difficult to find, land's expensive. I think in this situation, anaerobic digestion can be a solution for the city. In fact, they do run one, as you know, at the Dufferin Digester right now, and it runs quite successfully. With the provincial government passing the Green Energy Act, that will help some of these anaerobic digestion projects because they'll be generating more revenue from the anaerobic digestion power than they would have in the past. So that will help offset some of the costs. The current city program works from the point of view of they have an existing system, they made it work properly, they're producing a decent compost at the end of the day and they're generating green energy. So there is a role for anaerobic digestion in large urban centres like this. It's done all over Europe and I think the city is currently in an RFP process. We're one of the proponents of that process to build another one and I think that's a good solution for Toronto because it doesn't have its own processing capability outside of those anaerobic digesters. So I think that overall system can be part of their process. I think you're still going to need aerobic composting and I think leaf and yard waste, for example, which is still collected separately in the old part of Toronto, um, is a successful program that can be done inexpensively it can actually be done in open windows. It doesn't even need an enclosed system. So there are, there's a role for anaerobic digestion and there's a role for aerobic composting. I think the, the issue with carbon credits is simple. If you can use carbon credits to invest in your landfill gas system, so collect more gas than you would have if you weren't getting the credits, that's the reward for early action. And I think that's the whole concept of cap and trade. The people that can uh, actually reduce overall emissions by putting extensive collection systems in at relatively low cost and being able to sell those credits to somebody else who can't afford to reduce those overall emissions, that's what makes the whole system work. Well, time will tell in terms of the Obama system, but we're hoping that he comes up with a decent cap and trade that actually reduces the overall emissions level throughout North America. And Canada, of course, will follow suit. If you have a large landfill like ours, you know, we're taking in excess of 600,000 tonnes of waste a year there. You can make the economics work if you have a user within reasonable proximity. So we've invested big dollars there, I think in excess of eight or nine million dollars just on the collection system, plus the pipelines. 
that were built by Enbridge, which we have to pay back. Um, there, it, it does work for large landfills. The problem comes with smaller landfills. It's not so economic uh, to do these kind of systems. And I think that's where cap and trade helps, emissions credits. The project we have in Essex-Windsor, I don't think our engineer talked to you about it. We have a complete gas collection system in there and a much smaller landfill. The gas is collected and flared right now because we can't get into the grid. But that whole system was paid for by emissions credits. So this is the benefit of emissions credits. If they didn't have them, there would be no system there and that methane would be venting to the atmosphere. So I think it's a positive thing that we've been able to use emissions credits there to actually pay to put a system in. The municipality didn't have to pay a cent for that system. It's tough to ask a guy in the landfill business what the future for landfill. But we have a site there, we've recently got expansion for another 20 to 25 years, depending on the waste quantities we receive. I believe, personally, that coming from a European background, there's always a role for landfill. You can't burn everything, you can't compost everything. There's always going to be a need for some portion to go to landfill. I guess the question is, is how many more landfills do we need? And right now there's a chronic shortage of disposal space, as you know, in Ontario. Now, people, I got to tell you, windmills, solar panels, I mean, look at the biogas. It's everywhere, you know. In, in India, they're using biogas to, to, for their barbecues, the, in their own table scraps, their food scraps. We've got to get smart, people. We've got to get smart. Anyway, i got to hand it to Walker Industries. It's, a, um, it's quite a thing, you know. I mean, it, landfills, necessary evil. Uh, but, you know, hey, they're, they're waste, waste, they see a resource in the waste. Even in the waste that's been filled and capped and, and locked away, they came back and they're, they're harvesting uh, revenue, money, and doing some good things at the same time. Check us out online at www.goinggreenforgreen.tv or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Going Green for Green is brought to you by Ontario Electronics Stewardship and RecycleYourElectronics.ca. Welcome to Sustainably Speaking, where Going Green for Green takes to the streets to find out what's important to you about the environment. This week we're focused on organic foods and whole foods. We're down here at the Farmer's Market at Nathan Phillips Square, and we're going to find out whether it's health and motivation for your own well-being, or whether it's motivation to save the planet that changes the way you buy your foods. Are you an organic shopper? I definitely buy organic Often, I wouldn't say all the time. I buy like two or three things a week at the farmer's market. I feel like that's what I can do. Well, all the food is fresh and it's locally grown and so I want to support our farmers. The buy local thing has been a real real shot in the arm for us. What do you think of uh, California strawberries versus Ontario strawberries? I don't buy California strawberries and I rarely eat them in the winter unless somebody serves them to me. I will never ever buy them. I only buy Ontario strawberries in June. I cannot beat an Ontario strawberry out right now. We talk about shopping locally and at your farm, for example, you got jobs that are being created as a result of demand for your product locally. If everybody, if everybody spent $10 a week buying local produce, it would translate into a, an injection of $2.4 billion into our economy. And is it motivation for your own health to eat organically or is it really your concern for the environment and the elimination of pesticides? I think it's more so about my health, although the environmental aspect of it comes into play a little bit, but I think that probably the reason that I reach for the organic apple over the non-organic apple is because I think it's healthier for me. The Sustainable Development Technology Corporation is an investment vehicle that's been set up by the government to invest in clean technologies and green energy. Vicki Sharp, who's the CEO of Sustainable Development Technology Canada, made some time for Going Green for Green and is going to tell us a little bit about what the government's trying to do to stimulate this sector. What is exciting is that it's on both the supply side of energy and on how we use energy. So people are familiar, perhaps more familiar with the wind, 
uh, renewable energy, with biomass, with uh, solar, although less so with biomass. Um, and these are new ways of creating energy that are certainly suited to distributed generation sources, and they will contribute to our energy supply. We have a country that is just loaded with different biomass sources. They are usually waste products, whether it's from the organics, organics or... agriculture, forestry, etc. They cost money to get rid of. We're going to have to turn those into revenue streams that are new revenue for municipalities and these businesses. And I would advise people to look at an investment there because uh, anything that can take a negative cost and turn it into a revenue has got to be a good business proposition for sure. So people, welcome, this is Christy Pitts. I mean, what a park, fabulous, downtown Toronto, day 36 of the strike. And here we're just housing, I don't know, maybe a kilometer square worth of garbage and probably only a couple of weeks worth. It is astounding, astounding when you look at human behavior and what we do and how, how we deal with our waste. There are solutions out here, okay? We, you know, there, there is, we can divert, we can, we, can, we can separate, we can process our blue bins and we can, we can take the paper back. But in reality, um, human behavior just quite simply needs to change. This is, uh, you know, what, maybe a kilometer square for a couple of weeks worth of garbage and trash. When you, when you think about the size and the, and the amount of garbage globally, I mean, wow, it just boggles my mind. So, you know, the hardest part about this is that, there, you know, we got to pay for it, right? And we all say, oh, we pay for our taxes and, and you know, I, the magic at the curb is wonderful. Pick it up on the Friday, take it away. I don't want to talk about it. And you give me my tags and if you're going to charge me for four bags or two bags, whatever. But in reality, um, you need to get involved here. You know, you need to really look at this and, and, and realize what kind of a problem we've got and what kind of an addiction we have as a society to consumer culture and buying things we don't need. And we need to change our behavior. And at Going Green for Green, you know, we're both about the business side that's providing the solutions for this problem, as well as we're about the, the individual and how their life is gonna change and how they're gonna avoid or how they can help avoid all these increases in taxes, as well as find yourself a job in this new economy as traditional companies begin to go bankrupt or out of business or downsize. So there is hope. Uh, the humans are the solution as well as they are the problem. We just need to get active and motivated. Check us out online at www.goinggreenforgreen.tv or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. It's out of sight and out of mind What is the state of our humankind And I don't know what to say Cause we produce more every day And we call it garbage